I have been a psychiatrist for over 50 years. And during those years of listening to patients, both psychiatric and non-psychiatric or general medical patients, the most valuable lesson I've learned is, is this. No two patients are alike. Never assume one patient completely resembles another. Uh, there's these algorithms that exist, like the Texas uh, algorithm for medications. Uh, it's a set of rules. If this, then you do that. If this, that. And I don't like it. And I mention this because what I'm about to, to uh, present today is certainly not applicable to everyone. Uh, everyone afflicted with these illnesses. Uh, hopefully it might be applicable to most and maybe even to all. And today I hope to cover some of the feelings <clears throat> that we go through when facing a loss, the loss of an ability or a skill, whether completely losing the skill or partially losing it, and it could be the ability to walk or walk correctly, uh, speak or, or speak correctly. Uh, and this, of course, applies to the loss of a loved one. Uh, TV recently, I, I heard the expression, the loss of a liked one, which is new to me. Uh, and I'm interested in progressive neurological illnesses, not because I'm a physician and I've seen people with such illnesses, but also because my wonderful wife of 18 years, Nina, and I believe she's in the audience, she is so afflicted with a, a form of spastic paraplegia. We, by the way, we both learned a lot from the St. Louis conference we went to last year. It was, it was very good. So, I don't want to simply cover the physical losses and the emotions that arise as a result of such losses, but even further along, I want to get into the intricacies of these feelings. And you might say that I will deconstruct the feelings, the component thoughts, the component actions. Maybe we can get a better idea of them. And certainly I wish to affirm to you that these feelings are real, they're not right or wrong. Feelings occur to us. There's no such thing as a correct or immoral or right or incorrect feeling. They just, they just are. So let me add some different perspectives to the grieving and loss. And as the slide says, uh, helping the emotionally deprived feel emotionally empowered. Now, what does that mean? Well, how can you ha best handle the feelings that come over you? Maybe we can make use of the feelings in positive ways so that we can feel more in control of our situation. And I will set some examples uh, showing that yes, it is possible. I hope this is going to be an eye opener for most of you. Uh, different perspectives that might help you feel a little better about your situations. And, and by the way, it's not a pep talk. I, I don't I don't do pep talks. I I don't believe in them in, in, in psychiatry. <clears throat> so the agenda. Number one, two questions I pose to you. The first question is what single symptom of the many symptoms you get, physical symptoms, is the most troublesome for you? In other words, what problem or nowadays the euphemistic term is challenge? Everybody gets it. We're challenged by this. What do I have to cope with the most as I go through my, my day? And if you could answer, throw out some answers using one word, I would be very appreciative. Anyone? For my son, incontinence. Okay. Walking. Anybody else? Leslie? From walking. 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 Basic walking. Mm -hmm. Not being able to walk or run or move around. Yeah. Yeah. Get the body to do what it wants to do. Mary Schultz? Uh, I, uh, loneliness. Isolation. Very good one. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. That's right in line with what we're talking about today. Anybody balance. else? Mary? Yeah. Balance, too. Oh, walking. Balance. balance. Walking. I have For me, it's loss of energy. 
My, my yes. activity tolerance is really low. Repeat that, please. <laughs> For me, it's the the loss of energy. My activity tolerance, the loss whichever of it is, it's, re it's limited to one hour and a half, and then I become extremely... Yes, loss tired. of energy, and it's quickly depleted. Yeah, we've got a little uh, thing, a self-help thing about the spoons, how many spoons you can take to do a task a day. You guys get a chance to research that on our website. Okay, is that good, Paul? Yes, it is. I appreciate that. And one more question, and it's the uh, last question I have for you today. What is the most troublesome feeling? Now, some of you already mentioned this, the feeling yeah. that you have the most discomfort with that come over you uh, day to day. Again, in, in using one word, already I did get some, but uh, perhaps some more. Anyone pain. else? Pain. Okay, pain. The stiffness in, in my legs. Stiffness. Stiffness and pain. Uh, Go ahead, Mark. Stigma. The stigma of using a walker or walking device. Yeah. 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 I think me. That's it. Me. It's explaining to people what is my condition because if they see me. Like well, like I am, they don't understand that I will be tired and this and that. So it's it's the the way you can connect, you know, make people understand what you have without having to explain all the time. This is a very difficult. Yes, that is life. very That's good. Very good. I'm glad to hear those because um, we we have one more hand raised. If you don't mind, Doctor Paul. Yeah. Beatty? Um, yeah, for me, it's um, uh, I always have to check everything uh, where I'm going. Like if friends call and say, oh, we're going out to dinner and then we're going to go see a show. I first have to find out if it's accessible. And there's so many places that aren't very mm -hmm. Yeah, And you're in Toronto, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Very good. There you go, Dr. Mm -hmm. Paul. Is that good? Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased mm -hmm. to uh, hopefully I will affirm the feelings and help you through some of them. So, as I said before, feelings are neither good nor bad. And what I'm going to eventually get to, and during the talk, of course, I will cover, what is coping with a disability? And you've already mentioned some things, some troublesome things that involve uh, coping with the disability that you have. Uh, one of them is explaining to others, for example. And I will cover that a little bit uh, a little bit later. Um, one of the things that I tell uh, the, ch the child patients that I've had, child and adolescent patients who tell me that they've been bullied a lot, one of the things I explain to them is the people who bully you are bored with their existence. And so they look towards you for entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something to be afraid of or run away from, or certainly not to be embarrassed. But if you get a bead on the why the person is bullying you, it might help. Anyway, um, <clears throat> certainly I'll cover the five stages of grief and loss as they were uh, put forward by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross mm -hmm. in her book on death and dying in 1969. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of confusion about the, uh, the these, quote, stages, unquote. For example, aren't there more than five? Why five? Why not 10? Uh, another thing is, do they occur in sequence? And if so, do I have to wait for one to end in order to be in the next? Or do they have to be in the same order? Lots of confusion. And I want to also cover number four, the unwelcomed additions to the grieving and the loss. The priorities in life change. As one of you mentioned, you have to check and make sure that there's accessibility. My wife and I had a, a, a big problem with that when we tried to go to a, a town council meeting uh, recently, uh, where all of a sudden you, <laughs> there's no ramp. And it's like, well, well wait a minute. You know, and that's very good. It's a priority change that before you go out, that's a top priority for you. Some of them are good, some are bad. 
are not so good. Now, all through this, of course, deprivation, things are being taken from us. When things are taken from us, if you remember what it was like in childhood when your parents said no, what did deprivation, being deprived of something, feel like? I want to cover that throughout the talk. I will also briefly cover the convenience of having a sick member in the family, a labeled sick. It's amazing how having a designated sick person in the family can change the family dynamics. It's amazing. We'll get, get to that later. And number seven, comparing and contrasting a progressive illness with simply growing older. Eventually, if you grow old enough, you will find these things being taken away from you. Many of the things that unfortunately we cope with earlier on in, in life as a result of an illness. One of the things I found in elderly patients, elderly patients who are otherwise physically healthy uh, and have no uh, chronic diseases that need uh, attention of a physician on a regular basis, the thing that bothers them most that's taken away from them is the pr privilege of driving. That is extremely mm -hmm. important because it signifies to many, literally or figuratively, the end of independence. And that, of course, can be helped in therapy. And finally, I do want to handle prejudice, discrimination, and someone mentioned stigma. Um, where where do they come from? What is prejudice and discrimination? What are they all about? Hopefully, I will be able to cover that to an extent that helps enlarge your perspectives. Okay, so handling all the feelings I have. And very often, I feel like that inside because for one thing, I am embarrassed. I will get afraid because people will notice me for my being different. And embarrassment, of course, goes with that um, most of the time. Confusion and insecurity. What what was I just told? What's... what's uh, uh, hereditary spastic pyramid. What's pro uh, progressive uh, uh, PLS, uh, progressive lateral sclerosis? What what are these things? And why do I why do I have it? Is, is the doctor right about this? And what's going to happen? Fear, insecurity, confusion, longing for the past. Someone mentioned the inability to run, the inability to walk properly anymore. We long for the past, the good old days, for the past activities that we used to be able to do flawlessly. It's amazing how lucky young people can be, and we don't even realize it until something is taken away from us. Um, I had a patient once who uh, <clears throat> was determined to divorce her husband. And before she divorced him, she kept a, a diary of the things that he did that factored into her determination to divorce him. And it was a pretty lengthy diary. And I asked her what it was all about. And she said, ah, I tell you, three months from after the divorce, three months later, two years later, I'm going to think, oh, Egbert wasn't so bad. Oh, my goodness. We had a lot of fun. You know, maybe I shouldn't have divorced him. Longing for that, that's called glorifying the past. We all have a tendency to do that. And for her, it worked. Because when she started longing for the good old days, all she had to do was pull out her uh, journal, and she knew she did the right thing for herself. Pessimism. Now, pessimism goes along with globalizing and catastrophizing. Globalizing is where I have numbness in my left hand just came over me. Oh, my God. Does that mean I'm going to get numbness in my right hand? Does, does that mean I'm 
catastrophizing, getting them all over. Catastrophizing is where you take something and you get it to the end zone right away. The worst thing that can happen. And, and therapy sometimes can help deter you from getting that kind of uh, pessimism. And it does happen. Sure. And of right. course, as the, uh, the abilities or part of the abilities are taken away mm -hmm. from us, we feel helpless. And we that there's a lot of fear associated with being helpless, knowing that I have to depend on other people to do things or help me do things. Hopelessness, well, that's a bad one. Hopelessness is right up there with shame. Uh, shame and, and hopelessness don't have much use. And hopelessness can very much lead to despair. And by enlarging perspective on these kinds of feelings, maybe we can avoid hopelessness and despair. Now, I think someone might have mentioned loneliness, mm -hmm. uh, feeling alone. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I feel adrift. I feel abandoned. That's because I'm no longer in the in-group. I don't conform to the in-group. There's a lot of pressure on societies that we all must conform. It's almost as if we all must wear the same uniform every day. And if one thing is out of line with that uniform, oh my God, we got somebody to make fun of. Oh boy. You know, there's entertainment right there. Good conformity to the in-group is incredibly uh, uh, prominent in societies. So here we have the in-group. Everybody is merrily along, walking, talking. And then here I am, I'm in the out-group. All of a sudden, I'm one of them. I'm not one of us anymore. I'm one of them. And people will start making a, 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 a wide berth from me, around me, where I'm just going along. Uh, we see that in, in public when uh, we are walking towards people and uh, all of a sudden we see them, you know, it's like the parting of the Red Sea or something. I don't know. But this leads to the aloneness and feeling abandoned. Not conforming to the in-group and what the in-group say is normal, that, that's, that can spell a lot of bad feelings that we get. So the five stages of grief and loss. OK. Yes, the first one that occurs is denial. Most of the time, Paul, do you realize that your mother died last week? No. Oh, no. no. <laughs> That's impossible. I talked to her two weeks ago. Are you kidding me? No, no, no. First word out of my mouth. No. Be on the look for that in other people that you, you talk with. Uh, it happens almost every time. Another stage is anger. And anger is something that can be self-destructive or it can be self-productive. If we know how to handle it. And I will come, come up with some useful tips about how to make better use of the anger that comes over us when we are deprived of something. Bargaining. Now, bargaining is an interesting uh, uh, thing to go through. It's like a, a, a phase, but it can come here in and out. And uh, uh, the, the, these stages don't occur sequentially. They, they occur in, interchangeably uh, on top of each other. Bargaining, there's a lot of denial in, in bargaining. Bargaining is the what ifs, the coulda, shoulda, would ifs. My mother died last, what, what are you saying? No, 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 I just talked to her last month. She was doing great, you know, uh, but, you know, she still smoked 
five packs a day and she drank bourbon morning till night. I once again told her to go finally and see a physician about all this. And, you know, once again, she hung up on me. But this time I didn't call her back. Every other time I called her back. But this time, uh -uh, I was fed up. But what if I had called her back? What? Maybe she would have listened to me this time. Maybe, essentially, I could have prevented her death. In bargaining, what I'm doing with all of that mental machinations are about is I'm living in the past when she was still alive denying the fact that she's now dead. So I'm reconstructing, resurrecting the past. That's one of the main reasons why we bargain. Depression, some people call depression, anger turned inwards. Anger, again, can be very self-destructive. And um, I hope to provide some new perspectives on that acceptance now that's a tricky one i'm going to accept the fact that i can't walk anymore no 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 i can't accept that it's difficult to understand what acceptance is all about and well it involves being in in the present being in the new reality one of the things that uh the signs of healthy acceptance is when you finally can make fun of yourself with your disability. Now, if you can't make fun of yourself before you got disabled, eh, it might be very tricky to make fun of yourself when you do have something taken away from you, uh, if you do. And um, these people take themselves too seriously as taking the, the, the uh, well, taking themselves too seriously. Denial, anger, depression, they can go hand in hand with cognitive paralysis where I can't, I just can't think. I don't know what to do, I'm just afraid. Spiritual paralysis, when you start questioning your faith, it also involves <laughs> dreading the new demands that might be made upon me and it's just not wanting to bother. Okay, enough of that. Now what? What are you going to do? What do I do with these feelings? For example, the uncomfortable energy of anger. What, what do I do with them? What, what do I do with uh, my depression? How can I possibly do anything with that? Should I just sit here all by myself and pity pout? You know, some children, you take something away from them, and what do they do? They pout. Pouting is a form of basically doing nothing. It's a, it's a passive-aggressive form of hostility, and I'll explain that more in detail later on. Or should I just sit here being afraid? Now, isn't fear a stage, too, if you're going to label those other things as stages? The fear is very important, and we need to accept the fact that being afraid goes hand in hand with being deprived of an ability or a part of an ability. Also, I can't go around feeling angry all the time. People who go around angry all the time, and there are some people, well, they're miserable. They are miserable. So let's take a look at that later on. Say, maybe I can mobilize my anger. Maybe I can make use of it, not self-destructively or just uh, harming others, but self-productively. So what should I do now? Fe accept this disability and feel unacceptable to others? Is that what acceptance is? Maybe I could learn something new. 
you know, my wife has always been an artist to an extent. Well, as she has been tolerating uh, PLS, she, her artistry has blossomed. And I can't get over the amount of talent she has. Uh, she, she is in consignment shops. She does a lot of great art. She, she learned to make use of that skill as she became disabled in other areas. Well, this is a lot to, to go through, I, I admit. So let's get with denial. What's denial all about? What's its purpose? What does it look like? And I mentioned some of the, uh, man how it manifests already. I, I mentioned a few examples. The shock and awe, we get shocked. We get shocked each time. You have a, a you have HSP and you that's why you have difficulty walking, number one. Years later, well, you're going to have to walk with a cane now. Later on, well, you're going to have to use a walker now. And later on, maybe, maybe you're going to need a wheelchair every time. Every time I'm told the, the worsening of the illness, the same shock, the same intensity as when I was first told that I have this, this illness. And it's, it's a uh, interesting phenomenon because it's, it's as if it, 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 there's no consistency to it. I mean, at least the disease is being consistent. It's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Nah, we, we, don't, we don't like that. This change that's coming over me. Why me? I've got two kids to raise. I don't have time for this. This is baloney. Sorry. Something is different about me. And as I mentioned, I'm one of those people now. No, I refuse. I refuse. Denial is protecting us from these things. As long as I'm in denial, I'm spared these things. I'm spared feeling even more helpless than... We are in life, the human condition, powerless, sick, frail, fragile. I, no, 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 I don't, I don't need any of that. I'm too busy. Feeling out of control, deprived of dexterity, walking, talking. I had a patient once who was a professional uh, uh, certified translator for the UN. And of course, she had to speak very, very clearly. And she uh, became afflicted with a progressive neurological illness, and it decimated her. It took away not only the ability to speak clearly, it took away her, her livelihood. And she was very passionate about, uh, well, about translating and doing it well. And backing up to the impatience and self-criticism, a lot of people will say, I'm my worst critic. Before being dealt any kind of disability. And so the self-criticism and the impatience, as long as we are in denial, we are spared that. Now, these are subconscious things, okay? I'm deconstructing these things into the subconscious components so that we have a better understanding of why a person tries to deny reality. Of course, I don't want to face uh, these uh, possible changes in social status, health insurance possibilities. And as someone mentioned uh, the stigma, I, I want to avoid being made fun of because now I'm one of them and the us or in group are going to use me and they're going to make fun of me, ridicule me. I don't want that. I don't need that. It looks worse than it really is. The docs are wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. It looks worse than it really is. I have a, My wife and I went to the beach, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And let me tell you, give a bit of advice. If you want to find out how out of shape you are, go to the beach. You'll find out right away. It's it's a, a, a sure telltale. 
Well, she and I like to sit down in the sand and lie down so that the waves, when they're very, very small, are washing over us. Well, I brought a cane with us, okay? And people walking along the beach, they saw us, and of course they noticed the cane, and immediately they, are you okay? Are you okay? It's amazing how people say that. Are you okay? You could be sick as a dog, vomiting and losing bladder and everything, living on the street corner. And a person will come over to you and ask you, are you okay? Yeah, sure, I'm fine. We always say that, don't we? So we were okay. So I helped my wife get up and we were fine, moved on. The second time we tried that, here we are. And I tried to help my wife up. And in the process, I fell down. And then she fell down. And these three women rushed over to us. And they, they were determined to help us. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, my God. I, I, we don't need this amount. We don't need this help. We don't need it. See? And again, a form of denial. By the way, I must say that uh, I, my wife and I, had, well, she probably never forgot the goodness of uh, human nature. Uh, being a psychiatrist, sometimes you tend to forget it. But it's been very reassuring and heartwarming when a person will come up to assist you when they know that you're, there's something decidedly physically wrong with you. It is very heartwarming and reassuring. Another thing about denial that I, I use to uh, avoid something else is fear of prejudice and discrimination. Uh, it's unfortunate these, that these things occur. There's, there's some good reasons why they occur, which I'll get into later. Um, but the question is, am I no longer acceptable? Why are people putting me aside? decreased independence. Uh, many times I will say to somebody, no, 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 I don't need any help because I have difficulty walking. I have difficulty with my balance. Um, and I'm immediately going to cry out, no, I don't need any help. And I try to sound as patient as, and nice as I can about it. And of course, I will pretend that I'm still normal another way that denial is manifested. No, 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 I don't stick out. I don't, I still conform. I'm not going to use those crutches. You know, it's been a, a quite a while since I skied and I loved skiing. As I told Norma before, if skiing felt any better, it would be illegal. Well, nowadays, people wear helmets when they ski. I never wore a helmet. Ooh, it's ridiculous. I could not see if I were magically to be able to ski again. I could not see myself wearing a helmet. I don't need a helmet. And finally, denial protects me from getting angry. And uh, that's another stage that we, uh, we go through when we are deprived of something. Now, anger. What the hell am I so angry about? Anyway, I propose to, uh, to say that anger can be deconstructed into its component parts, its thoughts, the actions that might occur as, as a result of it or in association with it so that we can better understand it. When we're angry, it's manifested by being more irritable, being more frustrated and getting hostile towards others. Now, I let's say I received some bad news from the IRS, God forbid, and I start feeling afraid. It's like, oh my God, what, what's going on, right? So later on, I might be in a conversation with my wife and I find myself nitpicking. I find myself uh, criticizing a word she used or how she inflected her speech. And I'm getting more and more angry. Why? 
there's a good reason. I immediately take my fear, subconsciously convert it into anger. And the reason is that fear is a very lonely feeling, a lonely experience. And many times I'm the only one who can try to solve what it is that I'm afraid of. But if I can make someone else miserable at the same time, I've got company. I'm not so alone. I'm not so lonely anymore. That's one of the reasons why this happens, if not the major reason. Uh, again, a subconscious, there's subconscious here too, a uh, conscious mechanism that occurs. Does a loss change my basic character, my personality, if I lose the ability to do something? Well, I have an interesting story. I had a patient once years ago, very attractive young guy, uh, tremendous socialite. He, he was rich. He was a corporate officer, drove a BMW, handsome. But he was always also arrogant. Well, the women flocked to him. He was in a car accident and had to have one of his legs amputated. An above the knee amputation, by the way, which can be a lot more challenging than a below the knee amputation. He lost a whole leg. And he was de decimated because it was like, what's going to happen to me now? He was so used to being so popular. Well, Weeks after he got out of rehab and he was back working, he came into my office and he was as happy as can be. Oh, I, I thought, of course, he was on something, you know, he was on some drug. Well, no. <laughs> what happened to him was with the amputation, he be he there was some humility, some humbleness added to him, which made him more endearing to women. He became more attractive to women, and his social life improved as a result of the loss of a leg. It did, in fact, change his personality, and it changed it for the better. All right, so why is this anger useful? What's its purpose? Like I was talking about the purpose of being in denial. What's the purpose of being angry? As I mentioned already, it protects us from fear. It helps us understand that we, we are much stronger than this. I won't allow this to overwhelm me, damn it. I'm going to uh, bring it on. I'm going to get this. I'm going to nip it in the bud. I won't give in or give up. Surrender? What do you mean surrender? What kind of a word is that to tell me uh, when when I'm coping with the loss of, of, of speaking clearly? What am I surrendering to? I'm better than this. Surrendering. It's an important word. Surrendering to what? It's part of acceptance, of course. But surrendering has a, a negative connotation, okay? You know, you're in battle and you surrender to the winning side or you forfeit a game, you're surrendering, you're lying down and letting the enemy walk all over you. What am I surrendering to? To the loss? I can no longer deny the loss. I'm really outside of the in-group. Well, I'm really angry about it and that can protect me from the reality of needing to surrender, which I think it's surrendering to the loss of the ability uh, that was uh, taken away from me. Am I surrendering to those inabilities? However, what if I were to surrender to what I still have? Gratitude. You know, when we lose something, we focus almost totally on that which we lost. My HSP is taking my ability to speak clearly away from me, my finger dexterity. I can't play the piano anymore. We focus on the loss, and we it's as if we magically forget the things that we still have. 
the gratitude. I had a patient once, very interesting. He talked about his doorknob. I mean, a real doorknob. And he talked about how useful his doorknob was, any doorknob in his home or apartment. When he experienced something bad, he would go home and he would sit and stare at one of his doorknobs. And he would realize, now, I have that doorknob there. In order to have that doorknob, I need a door. In order to have the door, I need a door frame. In order to have that, I need a wall on and on. Well, obviously then, I have a house. Being grateful for that seemingly trivial thing like a doorknob made him realize that, well, he still has some things left to feel grateful for just by looking at that ins seemingly insignificant item. Gratitude is very important. Surrendering, mobilizing the anger so that we surrender to the reality, the new reality, to the point where we start embracing the reality. Now, embracing does not mean, oh, I love the fact that I have to use a walker. No, 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 not at all. It's that That's crazy, of course. And I'll explain what that actually can mean for a lot of us once we get into acceptance, healthy acceptance. So surrendering and acceptance can then move towards some self-enhancement, learning artistry or learning my my wife and I are taking up, up Italian, right? They're speaking Italian to each other. We're not going to Italy, but we're just doing it. It's something new to learn. So we're making use of something that we still have. So um, that is, I believe, the end of my talk for today. And uh, are, are there any uh, questions? <laughs>